All right. So um, the previous speaker said it's uh, yeah that she felt quite uncomfortable, you know, talking um, in such an academic audience. You know, I must tell you something from the start. It is actually also quite challenging for an academic to talk in front of an academic audience, especially if the first thing that you have to do um, after you set your title, which is energy means the world for the United States, that you have to be sorry that it's all wrong. And your whole um, idea of what you wanted to present is actually not going to matter. And, and how do we know that? It, it's because of Citibank. They know. Because you, the US will meet its energy needs by 2020. So it can't be if uh, we need our energy meets, uh, needs by 2020 ourselves that uh, energy means the world for the United States, correct? So I must be wrong. And there's the proof because oil prices are actually falling. So a clear indication that you know my whole idea is wrong. So um, for that reason, uh, the rest of the 40 minutes or so that I have here will be an apology for um, how I actually came up with that title and uh, why um, uh, I originally thought that energy matters, um, but now of course we know that's incorrect. So I still hope that some of you will not fall asleep and uh, follow me through my apology. Um, and uh, all, uh, maybe there's still something in there that you found interesting if, if it had been actually true. So anyway, so the, uh, the original idea came from a paper by uh, Jim Hamilton in 2009 who basically said that um, pretty much all but one um, post-war recession were preceded by an oil price shock, by oil price increase, I should say. Um, that's a pretty strong statement. It doesn't say anything about causality. It just tells us, well, this look, it looks like we are having a relationship between oil price shocks and recessions. So that deserves uh, some more investigation. And he actually also made the point that, um, oops, there is one skip here. Uh, he also made the point that the, even for the Great Recession, there seemed to have been, oops, that doesn't want to do what it's supposed to do. Ah, here you go. Even for the Great Recession that we'll see, like uh, the employment effects, that had a very big effect here. So this is actually the dot-com bubble that we're seeing here first. Um, so you see employment changes, red means you know, um, negative uh, employment growth. Um, the the dot-com bubble mostly had effects on um, Northern California, the Silicon Valley, and you know, a little bit down here. Um, uh, so, but uh, everything else here, the area where we are from, the, what's called the Inland Empire, that's where Redlands lies, was totally unaffected. Um, remember, that was also the time when we had this big run-up in the housing bubble that, you know, presumably was a major contributor um, to the Great Recession. So Jim Hamilton um, argues that actually um, this uh, price hike that we also observed right before the Great Recession had a very substantial contribution. So if it had a, a substantial contribution, let's take that as face value for now, I'll say more about it a little later, then let's see what the Great Recession did to employment growth as compared to what we saw um, for the, um, for the uh, um, dot-com bubble. So now, uh, as you can see, the employment problems kind of trickle down from Sacramento, go all the way down here. And so we're going, oh, so like uh, Silicon Valley holds up pretty well in the beginning, uh, while here in the Indian Empire and uh, the whole Southern California area was really suffering big time. And by 2009, we have what I would pretty much dare to call a bloodbath. <laughs> uh, at least, you know, it shows up nice and red, you know, like kind of change of colors. It's Redlands color, so it's a great thing for us. Uh, well, not really. So, uh, and it, as you can see, you know, this is a very persistent situation. Uh, the first to come out here is again Silicon Valley. They just went through a cleansing effect of a recession before. And so um, they're doing better in terms of recovery, and it takes a long time for all other areas in, in California uh, to recover and also like for other parts of the United States. Just uh, you know, I'll put it up here for, uh, for um, California. So uh, here you see Silicon Valley is doing great. Now finally, you know, after long years of um, basically no job growth, uh, we're back to job growth in California. However, I wanna make one point here uh, that I think is very important. If you take population growth into account, 
That's something that we're working on right now. Actually, for a lot of people in a lot of areas, that doesn't look very different than um, the uh, really lowest point of the Great Recession. So uh, don't be surprised if people say, well, for me, it doesn't feel much different. It, for them, it is really pretty much the same because we've recovered employment, but in the meantime, we had population growth. And so if you uh, take the net effects of this, uh, then we're not that much better off uh, than we were before. Okay, so another imp uh, important thing to realize is, is here, annual energy use by um, uh, per capita and GDP per capita. And what you can see is that's like, um, uh, yeah, uh, how, uh, taking a look at it over time, this relationship is remarkably stable, correct? So energy use and uh, uh, GDP per capita, both, both in per capita terms, are really, really pretty stable over time. So that's something to also keep in mind that inspired me to actually think that energy may matter for the United States, okay? And a closer look at the composition of uh, you know, uh, what we consume in the, in the United States in terms of um, energy, uh, in terms of the sources, what you see here is petroleum and natural gas, two things that I'll pretty much focus on today, uh, cover pretty much 60% of all our energy source. And uh, transportation basically exclusively relies on petroleum, very little on other sources. And uh, industry has also, is also a large receiver uh, of petroleum and uh, natural gas goes, goes all over the place and uh, electricity, and I'll come back to that at the very end of the presentation, electricity actually receives um, uh, its, uh, its uh, sources from a variety of, of places. Most of it is what they call here rejected energy, which means just dissipated heat. This is what we actually get in terms of energy services. So another reason why energy may actually matter is we eat oil and natural gas because fertilizers and pesticides are made from fossil fuels. And uh, by some sources, uh, they claim that for every calorie we eat in food, we actually burn 10 or use 10 in fossil fuels, 10 to one. Another aspect of it is the poor depend on oil much more than the more affluent. So if you look at the amount of, uh, you know, the, 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 the share of uh, income people spend, uh, the l very lowest income groups, of course, spend most of it on, on, in on food and then uh, on, on gasoline, but we already know that you know, food prices and gasoline prices are related to each other. And so another motivation that was very, very personal why I looked into this was um, not only because I have kids, but this is a, you know, a study done by Forbes in 2008 uh, looking at the cities with the worst pain at the pump. And so not surprisingly, you know, um, uh, California is uh, well represented in this um, list of uh, cities, but who is the winner? And that's where we are located, right there. So for us, that is a very important point. So what we did is we actually uh, replicated the Forbes study, but not on this metropolitan area, but we did it on, on the um, zip code level and uh, took all these different things like you know, uh, drive times that people have and uh, efficiency of cars and all these things into account to come up with an idea of what's the distribution, the spatial distribution of oil dependence in terms of simply here driving to work. So if you see a red area here, that means people spend more than 8% of their income on average, the average household spends more than 8% of their income just to drive to work. And that's where you know, potential income effects come from if we see oil prices rise. The problem with this graph that I've or map that I just showed you is, well, um, it's actually pretty difficult to see how important that is because you know, like these areas here that look all green actually don't have many people live there. So what we did is we actually reweighted that and to change that into what we call a cartogram or what you know, cartographers call a cartogram, which now represents the area in proportion to the number of households. And what you can see here is, you know, like I mean, um, we see a lot more red, orange, and yellow, like large shares of income spent on gasoline. 
then we see greens. Well, you guys here are safe, don't worry. So if you're from Rhode Island, you're safe. Okay, so um, going back to uh, you know, why that is so important, um, that's a, a little bit of a local story because uh, we just can't afford to buy all the data for the United States, so I need to give you that as an example here. Um, for us, it um, uh, yeah, hits very close to home because you know, it's not only that um, we saw you know, like uh, the, the, a large share of income spent on gasoline here, we also saw that these kind of issues are highly correlated with other risks. So if you just half close your eyes and you kind of recognize, uh, it's not a perfect overlap, sorry about that, um, the red areas here coincide with a lot of the red areas here. So housing risks and all price dependence is actually related and they're related through a very simple mechanism and that's income distribution. It's of course, you know, the poor, the less affluent that have a much larger exposure to oil prices than have those people who have, you know, nice incomes. You know, if you make in, in uh, excess of $100,000, you don't care that much about, um, uh, about oil prices. But it also has to do specifically for us in Southern California, but also other places uh, and around the United States with the distribution of sectoral activity. Uh, we are one of the um, areas with the highest density of um, logistics activity. So 30% of all trade coming uh, from China uh, goes through the ports of uh, Los, Los Angeles and Long Beach right there. And then it's distributed out uh, uh, across the nation as you can see with this, you know, uh, with this uh, picture. So that's how it's currently uh, going in terms of transportation. So what we do see is we see a spatial correlation uh, of uh, all prices and uh, other types of um, uh, problems and risks, specifically through, the, through income and the spatial distribution of income. Um, <coughs> in some areas it is that both jobs and uh, spending depend on uh, oil prices or energy prices in general. So what are the determinants? Let's take a look at this a little bit. Well, you know, I'm, an, I'm a simple guy, I'm an economist. Uh, we don't think in complex terms, that defines us, that's our you know, important feature. Um, so I'd like to look at it in very simple terms, supply, demand, price determination, and another important factor in this context is technology, okay? So, um, well, if you take a look at this one here, that's all the conventional oil discoveries that we had uh, in, in the history. So these uh, ones were forecast at the time when uh, this chart was put together. And this was the amount that we actually extracted. And by very simple you know, uh, rules, you can't extract more than you find. So the area under this, uh, sorry, the area under, the, uh, under this line cannot be bigger than the uh, area under this histogram, correct? Otherwise, we'd be able to, you know, suddenly find or, or you know, extract more than we actually have. Uh, the problem with that is it's not all that simple. It's all, again distributed a lot of, across a lot of countries. And one important aspect of this is that some countries actually have already seen what uh, we call their peak, their peak production. So this is a list. This is a list of um, of countries that. Uh, produced oil at some point, but actually are on the decline. And this decline at this point is roughly, you know, 3% per year. Well, that doesn't look very good unless we find other sources quickly enough. Now, you've seen here that, you know, like it looks like big oil discoveries are kind of a thing of the past, correct? So this may matter for us in the future. Luckily, that's not yet all the countries. There are still you know, uh, two handful or a little bit more uh, of countries that uh, have not yet reached their peak. This so much for the supply side for this moment. Let's look at demand. Well, actually, as some of you may be aware of, you know, um, the, while the United States and other developed countries kind of slightly and slowly decrease their demand for oil, it is specifically the uh, rapidly developing countries like China and India that increase their oil demand quite quickly. 
So it is important to understand you know, which one outpaces what. At this point, it is the developing countries that outpace our savings. And oil producing countries are actually um, consuming more oil themselves, which means there's less for us to import from them. Now, maybe we have enough behavioral change in the United States, because we're a very big oil consumer, to kind of make up for all that. Well, this is how I see it. If gas prices go up, we hear things like, that's it, I've had it, I'm going to buy a subcompact. I'm going to get a bicycle, become a vegetarian, and devote my life to peace in the Middle East. <laughs> Clunk. Uh, never mind. So actually, the issue with that is, that is quite consistent with academic research, because the researchers found that after three years, Americans behave as they hadn't been any crisis before. Um, there are exceptions to that, like the Great Depression had a long-lasting effect. The call is still out whether the Great Recession has a comparable effect on behavior. We do think that it does have for those who really were, for those who were strongly affected, but for, for those who were actually only marginally affected, it may not have. Okay, so in short, demand is rising, conventional supply is shrinking. Um, I don't see that we you know, have substantial enough behavioral changes to make up for um, uh, the, the, the shortfall in supply. So maybe technology can save us, correct? Okay, so one thing that has been big time in the um, discussion is something that's called fracking or hydraulic fracturing. So the question is, is fracking the solution? So um, what we see here is you know, a simple scheme, schematic picture or figure, uh, a display of what the hydraulic fracturing is. You basically go drill downwards. And then once you are in a uh, gas or oil bearing, bearing formation, you do what's called horizontal drilling. So you don't go vertically further, but you go horizontally. Then you put in a nice cocktail of um, you know, liquids, chemicals, and what have you. And uh, there it goes. It all flows out. And you can get uh, oil or gas from it. Okay? So I'm not going to go at all into the environmental aspects, because I do understand that there are experts here in the room that have a much better idea of uh, what that all means from an environmental point of view. Um, but uh, they will probably tell you that fracking is um, an interesting technology from an environmental perspective. And that's uh, what, where I want to leave it. Another aspect of it is really, you know, um, the Citigroup, whom, like the, the, whom I cited in the be very beginning, told us that we will have an oil boom. Look at this, you know, so we started out very early on, and two major fields here uh, will contribute for the next at least from now, from a perspective right now, for, for the next seven, eight years, uh, to a substantial increase in oil production. And there is actually, you know, uh, an upside potential that we may not have even accounted for. So that looks all great, correct? There's nothing to fear. So we're all fine. BP even goes one step further. They see increases for 15 years. So <laughs> you see, I was really in trouble from the get-go. The, uh, here, if you take a look, though, is if you, um, you know, uh, yeah, if they had arranged it in a more nice way, you could have actually seen that um, the peak conventional production in oil, which means you know you drill a hole and <laughs> out comes the liquid, was actually reached in around 2005. After 2005, the, all the extra uh, oil that came to the market came from other stuff. And so, as you can also see that this, you know, tight oil, shale oil that we're getting out here, that's actually not such a big contribution, and oil sands is not such a big contribution either. So we need to still rely big time on uh, OPEC and non-OPEC uh, crudes. So this is something that I um, find astounding that they put that in here, because uh, natural gas liquids is not something that you can put in your car so quickly and easily. And that's very important to understand because, you know, transportation is a major use of uh, petroleum. Okay. And so um, what you can also see is uh, that even BP sees, uh, like, the limit. 
here in 2035, if we take all the countries here into account um, by about you know, um, 7 uh, million uh, barrels per day. That's not even 10% of our total oil consumption per day that we have right now, to put that in perspective. So do it. does everyone agree? Well, we have something that's called the US government, and uh, as far as I remember. And so they have something that's called a, a Department of Energy. Uh, and so they have an Energy Information Administration. And so they said in their 2013 projection that, um, you know, we probably have um, oil, but we probably peak in 2019 in the United States. Now recall that actually even BP thinks that most of the, uh, which is the most optimistic prediction um, that we know, even BP thinks that, you know, most of the um, uh, tight oil and extra supply will come from the United States and not much from other places. All right, so that's something interesting. And you can also see that, you know, they think that a lot of it comes from uh, shale and tight oil and that we're kind of reducing uh, all the other major sources that we had in the past. So the 2014 prediction, just to, to you know, be, be uh, uh, accurate, is slightly higher than the 2013 one. Um, and it gives you three cases. It's a reference case, it's a low oil and gas resource case, and it's a high oil and gas resource case. So if you take the reference case, then we're probably reaching about the same as our peak production was before, including all tide oil. Uh, and then afterwards, you know, it's going to go down again. So that's, you know, even for them, it's around 2020. That's like six years from now. Okay, and so if the reference case is the correct case, and we're six years from a potential negative supply shock here, or supply development, because we can't call that a shock. That's not something you know, that's shocking. We know it now. We can refer to the data here. Then that's going to be interesting. Independent geologists don't quite agree with a total evaluation of the Energy and Information Administration. They think it may actually already peak in 2016, which, um, what's my calendar saying? Uh, is going to happen pretty soon, okay? So, well, whoever's right, I don't know, uh, you know, uh, you take your own judgment. But it could happen, um, quite interesting, uh, yeah, quite soon. And interestingly enough, though, the uh, Energy Information Administration basically adjusted their um, estimates. This is for the Eagle Ford, one of the two big uh, cases the two big oil fields that we have, more according to what, um, you know, what uh, the independent uh, people say um, relative to their earlier one. But they also see a much steeper decline, as you may realize here. Okay, so how do they get this information? Well, now we have a much better view of what's going on in the single wells. We know that there are so-called sweet spots in the, in the big fields. This is Eagle Ford which are showing up in red, and if you go away from those, then you're not doing that well anymore. So, but if you go really, really tight and put one tower next to the other, then you don't get out much anymore. Because the, the big problem that you face is actually um, that um, you have to drill again and again and again and again in order to get enough oil out of fracking. Because a fracking well is not like a regular oil well. A regular oil well, you know, you start drilling and it gives you, you know, a nice uh, output in the beginning. Then it actually even increases for a couple of years, two, three years normally, and then it goes down uh, very slowly. Fracking wells reach their peak right at the beginning, and after two years, 85% is gone. So you have between 15 and uh, 20, maximum 25% of oil still flowing after two years after you've drilled the tower. So you need to do what? Drill, baby, drill. You've heard that before, correct? So that's where it all comes from, I guess. Well, now we looked at the supply technology side. Uh, let's also look at the demand technology changes, which may actually be in favor of us and help us with uh, some of the uh, stuff that we're doing. OK. so. Um, uh, one interesting thing here is, well, you all know about solar panels and how they may influence um, uh, yeah, our, uh, yeah, our um, energy production in the future. 
Um, the interesting thing about solar panels is that they work in our favor in terms of the cost of installation. Installation costs for solar panels roughly decline between yeah, roughly around 7% per year. That means, for those of you who are familiar with the exponential function, that every 10 years we basically pay half. And you can see that, you know, from like if you look at the graph right here and you know take two random points and uh, take 10 years difference. Uh, in 2009 dollars, US average electricity cost was 12 cents per kilowatt hour. That's not necessarily the case for places like Southern California. Southern California, those prices have actually been quite substantially higher. This is uh, what happened uh, here. We are also, but also we have a lot more sun, which leads us to uh, the actually nice situation here that we are in the position that we've reached grid parity in places in Southern California. That means it is as expensive to get your energy from the grid than it is to put your own solar panels on the roof and produce your own energy. So grid parity is a big thing because now basically everyone who gets a federal uh, tax credit for their solar panels gets an automated you know, 30% one-time return. Not annually, of course, but one-time return on whatever they invest. So um, that, of course, is a nice incentive, but there's lots of uncertainty in the market. Uh, just as an aside, well, you probably wonder why not everyone puts solar panels on their roof in Southern California. It still only pays if you uh, reach a certain level of um, energy use. So if you have less than $150 bill, um, it may not work for you yet. Uh, that's number one. And secondly, uh, it's completely unclear at this point with uh, the situation with leases and so on, whether you actually will have a loss or a gain on the value of your home if you have a leased solar panel system on top of it because of lack of knowledge of how people should treat it. So that's what's happening right now here. So um, the other aspect of it is that, you know, transportation cha of fuel changes is a little bit bold, bold, I would say, has the chance to change. Uh, if you don't like this, maybe like this. Um, you may prefer this, same concept, different uh, brand. 4.4 um, seconds and from zero to 100. 92 miles to the gallon, doesn't sound too bad to me. Um, just the price tag, we have to work on that, I guess. <laughs> so at least uh, with my current salary. Anyway, so um, the, that all happens because of an, another important um, yeah, technological development in the uh, market for electricity, and that's uh, battery improvements. What you can see here is actually an even more dramatic change in battery improvement than we saw it in solar panels. Um, these lines here imply that we have a roughly 10% change in capacity cost combinations uh, for batteries relative to 7% um, yeah, for solar panels, which means then, by the same token of the exponential function, that battery capacity will increase every seven years, uh, will double, sorry, every seven years at the same cost, pretty much, or the cost will be halved. So that's kind of how you can roughly think about it. So which means that you know, um, in, in 14 years, uh, it'll actually be a lot harder for gasoline cars to compete in the marketplace than it's right now, even if gasoline prices stayed the same. And that's quite you know, remarkable in this context. So right now, of course, the effect on electricity on energy demand is, is tiny. If we, even if we take all hybrids and everything into account, like your, the Prius, uh, then uh, that doesn't have a plug-in uh, opportunity, then you have um, about a 3.7% share of uh, cars with some electrification under the hood. The pure plug-in hybrids and the purely electric cars are only 10% of that figure of these 3.7%. That's basically where it's uh, less than 0.4% for each one of them. So that means we're perfectly prepared, of course, for another oil price shock because so many people drive half electrified cars, correct? No problem at all. Well, I wish I could say I agree with that. 
um, because there is an important issue to understand, and that's how sensitive is our economy, or how, how sensitive has our economy historically been to all price shocks. So if you take a look at this um, chart here, uh, take the red line, the red line is in real prices adjusted for, um, for inflation. Uh, the black one is the nominal prices. So if you take the real prices, then you recognize two dramatic spikes here. Those dramatic spikes were quantity changes of about 5%. And the price response was about 100%. Economists call that an elasticity of roughly a factor of, of roughly 20. That means, you know, in percentage terms, it's a 1% change in, in quantity leads to a 20% change in prices. So of course, you know, we have no clue whether this extends to all ranges of the spectrum. And we also um, quite, you know, to just uh, be, be honest, we have, you know, different changes in other oil price uh, hikes. But this gives you a good illustration how sensitive the economy may react depending on how much it can afford those changes in prices. Okay, so the other thing that we noted here is um, like uh, if, you, if you look at uh, the here, you, we show the world supply of total liquid fuels and here uh, the real oil price in 2010 uh, constant dollars per, per barrel. What you see is as long as we are kind of uh, below a type of threshold, it's a very moderate increase in prices, but once we hit a limit, it looks like as prices were literally climbing up a wall. So now, with technological change, as we saw thanks to fracking, this wall may have moved because a lot of the fracking success happened after 2011 here. So, um, but the question is, did really the fundamental economic law of supply and demand change. And as an economist, I kind of doubt that. And this is also the view, even if we don't have any dis other disruptions, that the Energy Information Administration holds. So if you look at their price expectations, um, they give you, again, three uh, references. One is, you know, if actually things turn out to be not as good as they expect, then we see all prices climb relatively quickly, well, they do expect that we see, uh, you know, for some extended period of time, a potential drop in oil prices. And only if things go really, really uh, well for us in terms of uh, oil supply, then we see an oil price that's uh, pretty low in the 70s and 80s, but no way back to the $20, $30 um, per barrel in the past. And that has to do with another important uh, technical aspect and that is fracking is very expensive. So fracking is not as cheap as, you know, just drilling oil. Anyway, that of course yet doesn't take into account that we actually have substantial potential for unrest in major oil producing countries. So this is a list of uh, all, you know, different uh, kinds of uh, countries that's there. Uh, percentage share of the world oil production, not surprising, Saudi Arabia kind of leads the pack here. Um, this is the inflation rates and, uh, you know, uh, this is the uh, GDP P size. And you see that, you know, some of those, um, yeah, some of those countries here uh, have dark colors, which is uh, a warning sign because economic problems can also lead to a social unrest and that can lead to disruptions. And not surprisingly, if you look at the estimated un historically unplanned OPEC crude oil production outages, there's the same kind of candidates that you find in here, in the upper echelon of that chart here. Okay, so that of course has very well understood its effects. Uh, if we cut uh, down the Strait of Hormuz, then um, the world economy will probably not run as smoothly anymore as it did before. Okay, now there's also technology and uh, yeah, I call them geological uncertainties. Some people may be aware that one of the big future hopes for uh, oil exploration and uh, in the uh, fracking area was the Monterey field, the Monterey shale formation, huge, 13.7 billion barrels of oil. Um, some of you may also have read the news 
that US officials cut estimate of recoverable Monterey shale oil by 96%. So we're not talking to, we're talking by 96%. Uh, and that has simply uh, to do with the fact that, you know, that's California, that's North Dakota. <laughs> simple, as simple as that. Well, oh, and what do we have in California? Wasn't there something here that I should have remembered? Okay, so there are problems that need to be taken into account, and you, you should have thought that, you know, geologists took them into account earlier on. Um, but for whatever reason, they didn't. So what does that mean for me? From my perspective, it means that there is a lot of uncertainty in this market. And that has also to do with a very fundamental different problem. Joe, how was your last trip to Saudi Arabia? Oh, you haven't been to Saudi Arabia? Oh, so you didn't go and drill yourself and check whether all these declared reserves are actually correct? Oh. Whom shall we trust in this time anymore? <laughs> One should remember that the OPEC countries don't have proven reserves. They have declared reserves. So we need to trust or adjust or do whatever, manipulate, with what they declare to be true. So there is enormous uncertainty in this whole situation. And that's my, the main point here. So it's great that city says it's all wonderful and that we reach that, but A, it may not happen, and I'll give you some uh, more explanation of that in a second, and second, secondly, it may not matter whether we're independent of oil. And that's my next major point here. So what is energy independence? Well, it basically means you know, that our own energy supply is greater or equal than our own energy demand. Very simple, actually, correct? The problem may still be that may not be a complete match. We may have enough solar power and electricity, but not enough oil. So, but they claim actually that this is true for all energy categories, which is a very strong claim. So, um, well, but if they think, they think so. I don't think so. But that's uh, again, you know, city, I mean, just think about it. So many people make investment decisions based on what city says. No one ever made any investment decisions on what I said. So whom would you trust? <laughs> Correct? OK. So um, the other problem is, well, US energy supply can be US, uh, greater than um, US energy demand for all categories. But we may actually still trade with the outside world. And if we trade with the outside world and we get higher prices elsewhere, do we restrict our oil companies to sell to our domestic demand? Or uh, do we allow them to go abroad? What has been historically the US position? Of course we allow them to trade. So that means for price determination, what counts is uh, we don't have a closed economy energy autarky, which would, require, which would then allow us to have prices determined by our own supply and our own demand. And that's a huge confusion, at least in the press, it seems to me. And that's why I want to clarify that here, because that's not what we have. We have oh, even if you reach energy independence, then the prices will still be determined mainly by global supply and demand. And that may look entirely different. So energy independence, that's my conclusion, energy independence doesn't matter. It's not a closed economy energy autarky position that we're seeing and that would make us safe. In fact, we have l relatively low gas, or like relatively low gas prices uh, right now. Um, but uh, once we start building those terminals that are in process right now to ship it out to Asia where prices are much harder, higher, we may actually see an already an increase in energy prices here in the United States. Anyway, so um, what it means then, it's energy independence is not closed economy energy autarky. Um, the global oil price shocks can hit home as hard as they've ever done in the past. And uh, only rationing can potentially be avoided because we control ourselves, you know, where the sources come from. And, you know, you can step in with policy measures and so on. So what does energy independence mean? Well, there are clearly more uh, high paying jobs in the energy industry, at least for some time, as long as the shale boom lasts. And uh, we are 
um, to seeing yeah, rationing, uh, rationing to be less likely, and it may be a possible new lever of riches for all companies. What it does not mean is lower energy prices per se. There's no reason to assume that at this point. Uh, it doesn't mean that we see energy price stability at all, because it's still traded on the international market, and it does not mean that we're immune to global energy shocks. We may be able to buffer them a little bit more, but um, there's no total immunity to it. And so one thing that I mentioned earlier on already is a lot of it has to do also with, you know, uh, as we moved up with different sources, we moved to more expensive sources so, um, uh, of, of oil. So if prices go uh, yeah, lower, a lot of the fracking companies would be actually out of business. Uh, they need high prices to continue drilling, and the higher the prices are, of course, the more of those resources we can bring additionally online um, because uh, you know, even conventional oil sources only um, recover a small fraction of uh, what's actually in the soil, and you can use um, enhanced methods of uh, getting more of that stuff out. So we're not facing the end of oil by no means. We're more threatened by the end of cheap oil, and that's what it's all about. So um, how uh, likely is energy independence from the perspective of uh, the energy US government? Well, not very likely at all. So they actually still think that uh, we'll um, import uh, more than 25% of um, uh, yeah, uh, petroleum and other liquids. And that only in uh, the extreme case, maybe uh, we could reach energy independence, as little as it may mean, um, by around 2040. So let's look at what City did. Very simple. We learned two things from that. <laughs> City researchers, um, yeah, are uh, well. First of all, the, uh, I learned from it that it's uh, you know energy independence is unlikely. And uh, the second thing I learned from it is uh, City researchers are good at drawing straight lines. <laughs> okay. So uh, one important aspect that I uh, said before is, you know, and that's related to uh, what I've just shown you here, is that uh, you know, we had falling import shares here. But those falling import shares did not relate to falling prices uh, at the gasoline pump, which is exactly in favor of what I said before. It's short evidence, short-term evidence, but it's uh, pointing in the right direction. So what does it all mean? Well, first of all, it does mean higher paying jobs while it lasts in certain areas. So look at South Dakota versus North Dakota, annual per capita personal income. There's a remarkable change, and a lot um, people claim has to do with fracking here. Uh, secondly, well, there is a cost to it, though. Um, if you look at the oil production that we have right now and look at it in terms of energy return and energy invested, what you see is here, you know, there's a roughly you know, 20 to 1 relationship here for oil production. If you go to shale oil, that's four to five to one. So the re basically we need uh, four times more oil to produce the same amount of oil than we did in the past, adding to all the greenhouse problems that uh, we're familiar with. And that's, you may have l l looked at, uh, noticed that it's also worse than photovoltaic, even right now. Um, and uh, oil discoveries, regular oil discoveries are not doing much better either, what's coming on you, but it's still a lot better than ethanol, just in a, as a side. Okay, a reality check. The news are not really encouraging. If you read that, we're losing all our shirts today. We're making no money. It's all in the red. Uh, CEO of Exxon Mobil, June 2012. The United States oil and gas industry has overfracked and overdrilled. Royal Dutch Shell. 2013, Shell writes down 2.2 billion in shale assets and puts Eagle Ford properties up for sale. 2013, okay. And if you look at natural gas prices or oil, oil prices, they don't indicate a glut, really. So let's go back um, to, to the original slide that I showed you here. Um, we are very dependent on petroleum for transportation. We are very dependent on natural gas for a, a variety of sources. Um, I mentioned that because a lot of people think that uh, natural gas is basically safe, but 40% of the natural gas in the United States that we get right now is actually from fracking. And uh, some ge geologists uh, claim that at the moment the oil boom 
goes down for um, fracking, so does the gas boom for fracking. And if that happened, that could have quite substantial effects here. So um, the other interesting thing is if we move to more electricity um, driven um, so, uh, yeah, society, then we have what you know, uh, Michael would probably call a platform uh, uh, effect here, because here the electricity and the specification is the hardware and all these other input sources are the potential competing softwares um, that can um, diversify, have competition, uh, and ha allow us for cheaper production cocktail. And then uh, we would like to add transportation to the other side of the platform in order to have more uses and have the same benefits and effects. And uh, that also allows us to get GDP growth that's a lot less dependent on, GD uh, on energy um, because uh, if we move to services and away from, um, from industrial production and so on, despite everything that the Obama administration tries to achieve right now, then we can achieve higher GDP with less energy. So in summary, I strongly believe as an economist, the laws of supply and demand don't change, period. What changes are factor conditions and technological process, and it's basically a horse race between the factor condition changes and the technology changes on the supply side and the demand side. There's high uncertainty in the market. The global risks are really rising on this. Despite the short-term twiggle that we saw, yeah, that's actually the inter other interesting thing that I actually really wanted to show you. Um, this is the twiggle here, uh, uh, roughly the size of the twiggle that uh, we cite in the, I cited in the beginning. So that's basically in the larger picture that's completely uh, unimportant. Uh, and uh, yeah, energy independence does not make any difference to us. We don't have autarky. We're still extremely vulnerable. Uh, and the, uh, I do believe that the US economy is still highly dependent on energy prices because of all the arguments that I made in the beginning. On the other hand, this is an academic and entrepreneurial opportunity of unmatched size, once in a lifetime chance of making contributions and figuring out what's going on because many, many, many of the questions that I touched upon today are not well understood yet. Thank you very much. <laughs>